This is January 16, 1984. I'm Emily Sherman interviewing Miss Amabel North. We're on Rhode Island Avenue near K Street, and our subject for the Newport Historical Society is the neighborhoods of Newport. Ms. North, I'm going to start with some biographical pointers, and uh, the first part of my interview is going to be on your family life. Then we're going to go to your education and on from there. Uh, where were you born? I was born in London, England. Where were your parents born? In England, but I don't know the exact location of my father. My mother was born in a place, small community, called Sturton Candle. That's a lovely name. Uh, that was in the southern part of England? Yes, I think so. I think it was in Dorsetshire. Would you mind, uh, for the record, uh, telling me uh, when you were born? You don't have to if you don't want to, but to make the, the uh, history come out right when we are talking about your early years, it would be nice to place you in this century. Well, I was born August 26, 1905. And how long did you stay in London? We left London in 1910. How much memory have you got of those early years in England? One thing in particular that I remember is seeing pony cars lined up for competition at the Crystal Palace, which was fairly near the house we lived in, in the London suburb of Sydenham. That must have been a very exciting thing. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, two brothers and one sister, all older than me. Well, now, could you tell me, uh, when you went to the Crystal Palace, something about how you were taken, and uh, were your siblings along? I can't remember ever actually going to the Crystal Palace. But the ponies you do remember. Right, because they lined up on the road near our house. The, um, at that time, uh, what was your father's occupation? My father was not living. He died before I was born. He died in March as I was born in August. Well, that may have had something to do with uh, your coming to this country? Uh, yes. You see, my mother was employed by an American lady who had chosen to spend much of her time in Europe. And while she was in her service, she married and had the family. In 1910, we went to Rome. Because she, my godmother, was very interested in the classics. We stayed in Rome until 1912. The summer of 1911, the family, including my godmother, came to Newport for the summer. And then the following year, 1912, came to live in Newport. 
Uh, was your father also, uh, at, the, at the time that your mother was with this, uh, actually your godmother was the employer, was your father also in her employment? Right. Had he changed jobs before he had done that? I really don't know. Um, have you any memories of those few childhood uh, months in Italy? Yes, I remember the Borghese Gardens. I remember St. Peter's. I remember the Victor Emmanuel Monument, which was just about completed when we left. I suppose you didn't know what a wonderful experience you were going through at that time. No, I certainly did not. not. Do you think your brothers and sisters were old enough to appreciate that? I think so. Yes, I believe so. When you did come to Newport, would you start telling me what your memories are of those days, not necessarily your own memories, but what you know now through your mother having told you? The first summer we came, that was in 1911, we stayed at a boarding house at 131 Church Street, operated by a Mrs. Keating. I can remember walking along the cliff walk and up Bellevue Avenue. How tired I was when I got back to the boarding house. Rather late for dinner there, too, because we took all our meals at Mrs. Keating's, because restaurants were not as numerous as they are today. The Viking Hotel was the Hilltop Inn, a frame hostelry, very different from what it is today. I remember going to the beach, but uh, that summer I really can't recall too many actual experiences. I am aware that in Newport at that time, there were a tremendous number of boarding houses. Some of them were residential hotels, actually, but that was a very prevalent uh, way that uh, people came for the summers, as well as those who lived year-round. Now, that would have made quite a difference uh, in your childhood of living in a boarding house than if you had been living in a neighborhood. Could you tell me how you uh, met people your age and when did you start to go to school? Uh, that summer in the boarding house, of course, we didn't meet any people our own age. We were just the four children. In 1912, we did start to meet people when we came to live in the former Caldwell House at the corner of K on a road street. Our contacts then for the boys came through public school. My sister and I were tutored. However, with time and the beginning of World War One, we did get out into the community, as it were. 
first of all, let me say, we met contemporaries through St. George's Sunday School. The World War I activities came through going to make surgical dressings for the British Army. And since our roots were in England, we were asked to help out in that way. Even young children could do that sort of work. If I recall correctly, Miss Cockrell was in charge of the organization where we made the dressings. I remember that the building was located opposite Redwood Library, just about where the Vogue shop is. I think that's really my earliest memories of getting out into the community. Now, at St. George's uh, Church, uh, that was on Rhode Island Avenue yes. at that time, still is. Uh, was there much Sunday school Yes, life? very active Sunday school. And then with the passage of time, we got into some of the organizations of the young people, such as the Girls Friendly, and we would have minstrel shows, stage plays, and that sort of thing for the interests of young people. Now at this time, you uh, and your sister had still not gone to a school. Right. You were still being tutored. And at that point, I suppose you were far ahead of your contemporaries as far as your reading, writing, and experience and knowledge went. I imagine we were, yes. Would you uh, please tell me about the tutor or tutors yes, that it you was had? Miss Collins, who later had her school here. Would you uh, tell me as much as you know about that? Because I think we are going to find out that your interests are very much in education of uh, Newport's young people. And if you would, tell me a little about Miss Collins. Well, she came as a governess when we went to Italy and stayed with us uh, continually. After I went to high school, in 1918, at that time, uh, let's see, 1918, and later, I think it was 1926, she established her own school. Her first classes were held, I believe, on the top floor of what was then called the Equipment Industries on School Street. Later she moved to Mount Vernon. I may have those locations reversed. And then, of course, she purchased the house, the old Tuck boarding house at 18 Rhode Island Avenue. When numbers made it necessary to expand, she rented a house at 73 Rhode Island Avenue for the primary grades to get the intermediate grades at number 18. She was forced to vacate 73 when the house was sold and moved the lower school to 48 Everett Street. Uh, that 48 Ed Ed Everett Street was formerly the home of Mrs. Thomas Lawton, an old Newport dowager. Now, 
let us go back because we'll come back to uh, Ms. Collings uh, later on when we talk about Newport's educational facilities. Um, you said that the, after the boarding house, you moved to Arolt Street. How long were you on Arolt Street? From 1912 till we occupied this house the day after Christmas, 1925. So you have really spent all of your life in this neighborhood that the Historical Society is trying to put into the archives. And we are very happy that we've been able mm -hmm. to find you in this area. What we are trying now to find out is just exactly what one area of a town after a long life has meant to a new quarter whether it has left any impression as far as the area goes. And uh, loosely, our K Street, O Beach Road uh, uh, area is uh, going to be a little, a little more difficult to pinpoint because I don't believe there is that neighborhood feeling, but I'm not supposed to say that. We're supposed to find that out after we go through a few of these uh, questions. Uh, besides your parents, uh, uh, besides your uh, brothers and sisters and your mother, there was no family at all in Newport. Right. Uh, Did anyone else live with you uh, during those uh, uh, years on uh, the Arol Street in the Arol Street house? Yes, uh, Miss Steer, who had been with Mother as our nurse from well before I was born, was there. Miss Collins lived there. And then, at the beginning of our residence there, we had a butler, his wife and daughter, from Italy as staff. Oh yes, and there was another friend of theirs, an Italian girl. But eventually, they got a little bit homesick for Italy. And so they left. But that was not till after World War One. So you see from about nineteen twelve until or oh, we'll say fifteen or so, nineteen fifteen, that was the household. That was a large, quotes, extended family, wasn't it? It was indeed. Um, I, I would think with Miss Collins living with you, did she have more influence over your education and your hopes for the future and your siblings' uh, education and hopes for their futures? A more influence than your mother? Uh, I think possibly because my mother, of course, had the responsibility of looking after my godmother. And she was really a pretty busy person. Did your mother leave the house every morning? The, uh, the, uh... You see, we lived with my godmother. Uh, that uh, was that was not quite made clear in the beginning, and and so now we understand. And then she must have died when you came to this house. Right. He only lived about a month. My godmother lived only about a month after we moved. 
Was he an invalid at the time that you were there in, on A. Rolf Street? To a great extent. So that your mother's time was almost entirely taken up with, with her. And the, uh, the rest of the household uh, were taking care of yeah, well, uh, her and, you, and yeah. you, you children. Yeah. Well, mother supervised it. Uh, tell me about any discussion of your future that you might have been aware of as you were being tutored along the way, what hopes there were for the education of you four children. Well, I think it certainly extended to a college education, but uh, no fields were really discussed. As it turns out, after you had outgrown your tutor, what, did you go to the high school? Right. As the first, as the first uh, public educational right. spot. Tell me about your adjustment of meeting those yeah. people. I didn't find too great an adjustment because I had met some of them at least through some school, and of course the classes were much smaller in those days. Than graduating class just over a hundred, and we all sat on the stage of the present Johnson Junior High School. Uh, no, I can't say I found a difficult adjustment. Your uh, older sister had waited to go with you, or had she no, gone ahead? No, she did not go to a high school. She went directly to the New England Conservatory. Without any formal public education. I think that um, your being able to adjust to that boy and girl relationship at the high school was was quite interesting. You must have had some some problems along well, the I way. I suppose I did, but I can't remember what they were. Uh, one of these questions is rather uh, superfluous. Uh, how were your school experiences valuable? <laughs> well, they got me where I am today. <laughs> I suppose uh, you would hesitate to tell me whether you did well or not in the uh, high school. Oh, I think I did pretty well when I got there. Norman Medical Scholarship. At that time, uh, was there a, uh, a Rhode Island Honor Society? No. That came later. Right. The Norman Medal, tell me, uh, scholarship, uh, did that mean that you were the highest in the right. number one in your class? Right. Would you remember back to what kind of curriculum you had? Because uh, later on we're going to, to discuss a little bit uh, in our next interview about the schools and education that you experienced as a professional. Uh, any little um, thoughts about Thompson's uh, well, I, we know that it was in the building of Thompson, about Rogers High School. Yes, I recall that I took class of the academic course, then known as college preparatory, and there was emphasis on English, languages, Latin, everyone had to take at least two years of Latin that course. I took four, I took three of French, two of Spanish, but I'm no linguist, and three years of math, only one year of science, because girls were not supposed to be too fluent 
Tell me about the physical education program. Oh, yes. I can see us now in our full bloomers, midi blouses with the navy, what we call the navy black ties, forming with the instructor, who was Miss Nancy Brownell. It was really more what today we call calisthenics plus dancing. Dancing that might be at any square dance now. This is Vera Slocum played the piano for all the classes. Really to music. But once in a while, maybe we'd be given a basketball to throw around, but no formal games. Well, it just wasn't time. And, of course, the girls had to share the gym with the boys because the new addition fronts the, well, at least backs up onto Center Street was not built. That addition was built after 1922, then? No. It was built after 1920, when Rogers High School suffered the fire. I think we'll go on to that. Uh, I think that has great possibilities of more reminiscences. So I think now we will find out uh, just a little bit more about what your experiences at St. George's Sunday School uh, meant to you. Um, did your mother go to that church? Yes. Regularly? My family did, yes. And um, can you describe the building? Well, it was much as it is now, except for the fact that the stained glass window was not in place at that time, as, it, as I recall. There were memorial windows, but the layout of the church was as it is. And the new pair, the parish house was somewhat smaller, not smaller in fact, and it was a frame building. The new parish house was built at a later date. We call it exactly when. And the outside was changed from its yes. original yeah, shingles. Oh, uh, yes. It was a shingle. And it was no large parking lots in the area at all because there weren't the automobiles to occupy them. Did you, uh, you did not receive any special religious education. Uh, you must have uh, become a member of the church at the routine time right. that everyone... Right, confirmation. Of we had confirmation classes in preparation for that, that ritual. Uh, did your... Uh, Sundays uh, have to be spent in a different way from the routine. Were there any Very restrictions on Absolutely. how sa the Sabbath was kept? Tell me if you can remember some One of thing the... I remember distinctly was there was absolutely no needlework or sewing to be done. That was put away from Saturday. 
And probably you knew the proverb that what was stitched on the Sabbath was taken out with your nose on the, <laughs> I can't and something like that. that. I was brought up that way. Right, right. Um, was there any um, occupation or um, recreation allowed on those Sabbaths? No, the time was spent mainly in meeting. You didn't go out to play. And uh, did you have to go to more than one church service? Often. Morning and evening service. Did you uh, celebrate the uh, religious holidays, the Christmas and so forth, in any uh, special way? No, they were family affairs. And we always had a Christmas tree. But uh, other than that, I can't recall any special things except the observance at the church. It seems to me that Easter uh, has uh, not continued to be uh, celebrated in the same way that it was uh, 50 or more years ago. Uh, did you uh, celebrate Easter in that springtime rather than religious way? Well, I suppose one of my memories of that is, of course, we always had to go to the three-hour Good Friday service. And one of my earliest memories is that after that service, Mother would take us girls downtown to get new hats and down Now we want to get on to this neighborhood relationship. Uh, did uh, you and uh, the neighbors around you uh, talk to each other? Were you friendly with the neighbors on either side or around you. This is uh, later on in your uh, life, probably your uh, teen, teenage life that I would like to know about now. When we lived on K Street, we had absolutely no contact with our neighbor on K Street. Nor did we have contact with the neighbor who lived beyond us on Avel Street because the Caldwell estate extended from K Street to the house of a Mrs. Fay, which faced on to Francis Street, that's located on Hill. We knew the names of the people who lived across the street, among them Captain and Mrs. Rufus Johnston and her family, the Stevens, he was one of the Executives, I believe, of the Newport National Bank at that time. And next door was Arthur Comerford and his nieces, the Watson girls. Arthur Comerford was an insurance man, and Sally Watson was a teacher in the elementary grade. I really don't remember what Ollie, her sister, did. 
Those were about the only neighbors that we would speak to. But we didn't exchange social calls with any of them. Of course, across the street from us on K Street, Mrs. Robinson lived. Uh, I don't ever recall seeing him. Of course, Elizabeth Johnston, Captain and Mrs. Johnston's daughter, I knew through Girl Scouts. I think she was in high school, too, as I recall. But she was behind me. I would say that I knew her. Do you know where she is now? Uh, I think she is married to um, an Episcopal minister and lives somewhere in the dead of Massachusetts area. Uh, before uh, its uh, teenage, uh, did you go out to play as uh, some children are uh, sent out to play. Do you remember um, no, doing you... anything on the sidewalks or the street? No, because we had a large enough garden to play in. Large enough that we had a lawn where we could set up a, an undersized, to be sure, tennis court all the equipment for the tennis court had been transported here from England. Even the net to surround the court and the steel poles and the tennis net itself. So this was unique, was it not, in yes. uh, a house uh, because uh, people did not uh, usually have either the grounds or or the equipment. It was usually croquet. Did you play croquet oh, yes. also? We had croquet, yes. But see, the tennis court was located where two houses uh, are built facing on the old street. What a big expanse of land there. That has really tremendously changed. When did that Caldwell House come down? Well, of course, it was after 1925, I said maybe 27 or something like that. Was it destroyed or did part of it get moved somewhere? No, none of it was moved to my knowledge. Was it a big Victorian house? Yes, yeah, something like 40 years. We used to bat a tennis ball around two on the third floor because there was a lovely corridor up there. And we also had one room fitted up for plays. And we had a stage made of boards on wooden packing boxes. The boards had come from the packing cases that brought the furniture over from England. So there were good wide sides, you see, and there was a convenient closet to be used as a dressing room. And all sorts of things were staged up there. Did you have uh, friends come in, or was it just you children? Mainly uh, us children. But we did have, my brother Stuart had two good friends, one of whom became very famous, John Howard Benson and Charlie Hughes. And just about every day at four o'clock, Stuart would bring them home for tea. I don't know how many cakes the cooks didn't make per week. My father was particularly fond of my mother. Uh, you know, his 
long legs and has a boy, lured him into seeing how high he could jump. And I recall one day he was going home and he tried to jump over some ash cans that had been put out for the collector. And he fell. And the result was a bloody nose and a broken nose. And he came back to my house yelling, I want Mrs. Lord. Although he was halfway home, <laughs> he lived at that time on Royal Street. I am going to uh, ask you later on a little bit more. I think it would be very nice for the archives to have those uh, memories that you have of John Howard Benson, but we will identify him later on and go on now to... Uh, I didn't know the name of the other uh, boy that you mentioned, Hughes. Hughes. Did he do anything interesting later on? Yes, he did indeed. He was very interested in music, and he became a professor of music. I know at one time he was at Hunter College, but I think he was also at New York University. He left the area. Was there any person in your neighborhood who played a particularly important role in your life outside of your own household? No, I can't say there was. Uh, Tell me uh, how uh, you were uh, disciplined, how uh, uh, yes, you, not necessarily your, your siblings, just you. Uh, who disciplined uh, you if you needed discipline? My mother. She didn't spare the hand when it was necessary. This was her uh, British background, I, uh, I take it. The, uh, the tutor, did the tutor turn out to be Miss Collings? Yes. From the very beginning. Right. It was always Miss Collings, but we've got that, that straight now. Uh, she, having lived in the family so closely, uh, must have had um, some authority to uh, to do discipline. Well, yeah. of course, the homework had to be done, and certain hours were set aside for that homework. Tell me about uh, reading. Uh, before you could read, uh, I suppose the, uh, the siblings learned quite some time before you, and uh, or did you learn early with them? Well, no, I guess that I didn't really start when they did, but I can't uh, recall any contact with siblings and helping me learn. That's what we haven't mean. established the difference in the age between you, the youngest, and the oldest. Five years. Only five years in the in the four children because of the exactly twins. Exactly five years, less one day. That is very very interesting, and uh, the older brother, and then the twins, or the no. twins, the and twins then, and the, then brother, the brother, and then you. Uh, I suppose that when you were being read to, it was Miss Collins who read to you yes, until or you could read to your Miss Steer. Um, were you fond of reading to yourself as soon as you were I think proficient? I was. I can't really remember too much, but I know I did a good deal of reading. I was brought up on not so much the classics except in schoolwork as the Bobsy Twins and series like that. You were allowed to do that? Yeah. 
um, that does not sound uh, like the uh, scholar that you became. <laughs> Well, we don't, uh, we don't have to go into uh, any of the reasons that you are living in this neighborhood now because you had no choice. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> and uh, so in this particular house, uh, you have been living since 19... The day after Christmas, 1925. And uh, that is uh, just uh, about as long as um, the house beside you uh, was built. Um, did the builders of the house to your uh, east, uh, were, were you uh, friendly with, yeah. with them? Dr. and Mrs. Hammock Rogers. And then on the other side of you, there was open land. No. Hannah Hassett lived there. It was really a Newport tradition. In the little house that is there now? Right. And that house was already there when Mother built this house. I would have thought to the contrary. Well, that was already there. She was very curious at the beginning, because we learned this much later, as to who bought that land, because my mother's name was not attached to the sale. I believe it was an auction sale. But Mr. Thomas B. Congdon of the bank bought it for her in her name, you see. And, uh, from the earlier plats, um, this this lot had belonged, hadn't it, uh, down to the how did she how, how did how did uh, is it Mrs. Hazard? Yeah. How did she have that small little know. piece? I don't know. When the other lots along the whole of Rhode Island Avenue are so large. I don't know, I don't know how at all. She was here first, you see, and she, as I say, wondered who was buying this, because our lot, as you know, is a peculiar shape. It is, uh, it certainly must have originally belonged to her, and she just did not have that yeah. uh, ability to buy. I believe that the house that the Rogers, Hammett, Hammett, C. Hammett Rogers, Rogers built, uh, had belonged to the land of the house next to it. Oh, Miss Lieber's, so Lieber's land, I, I think. And it. maybe the whole thing had been Lieber property. Yeah. But I think this, uh, when Mother bought the land, it was owned by Thomas P. Tanner, who lived, uh, uh, well, somewhere in the vicinity of Hope Street in Rhode Island Avenue. I'm not sure if it was a corner house or the house. We will do a little research on, on that. Um, you implied that this Ms. Mrs. Hazard was a character? Yeah, I think she was a nice character. Not uh, peculiar, but she was very interested in all that was going on in the neighborhood. That, uh, that shows that we do have this little nucleus of neighborhood uh, interest. Um, your mother uh, got an architect. Uh, yes, all of this was handled by Mr. Condon. And he tried to get a Newport ar architect. One of the people who he approached Peyton Hazard, and he always smiled out loud because Peyton Hazard couldn't undertake it because he had gout in his big toe. So Mr. Condon got an architect from Fall River, and he planned the house 
mother had seen houses on Jamaica Way going into Boston. That's the kind she wanted. So, oh, that's the architect. It would come back to me. And Paul really came and she told him what she wanted. He drew the plans. John Kelly built the house. Because everyone has told us that beautifully built buildings. And I think it shows it because, of course, we tried to maintain. I don't know, we should probably, but uh, a great deal. stood up there. No bricks we pointed or anything of that sort. Stands Mr. Kelly's paper. It is the only brick house in the entire area. Yes, except for the present uh, the old Rooney house up at uh, Corner Catherine in Rhode Island. Ah, yes. Is, yes. Uh, I forget about that. And yes, the only, the other, only one. other one. Mother wanted brick, as I say. She thought it was more durable, etc., etc. I think that probably came from her um, English background. Oh, I think it did. That uh, yes. only cottages were made of, of uh, yeah, maybe shingles and, yeah. and um, boards. Maybe. Um, she certainly uh, chose a very, a very nice plan and a very, very livable house. And um, I'm sure it has satisfied you all these years. Um, there were probably things you didn't like about it and things that you did uh, like about it. But by that time, when you came here, there was only your your mother, your brothers and sister, and Miss Carling. And Miss Dear. And Miss, my godmother. Oh, I she misunderstood. She came here. She came here. She died in this house. I, I'm glad we got that. Uh, but the raft of servants did not come. No, only one came. That was a girl who was the daughter of a friend of my in England. She, when we needed help, instead of hiring over here, she suggested this young woman might like to come. Did she stay? No, she didn't. She... We didn't uh, establish about your uh, citizenship. I was naturalized first in my family in 1927. I think I should look on my papers for the exact date. You see, it had to do with being employed in the school department. And uh, Judge Murray told me once, of course, that I took with her that I must have sworn illegally to uphold the Constitution of the United States, but I maintain that I'd already filed for my first papers. Therefore, I had work to do it. So nothing ever came out of it. Right? She didn't pursue the thing, although she could have legally, I suppose. Uh, did you, uh, Miss North, always feel that you were an American as soon as you came over here permanently? Mm -hmm. And the uh, other children probably felt the same way. As I know. And they followed you and became citizens? Yes. Yeah. I don't know, remember the exact dates that the boys became citizens. Oh, that I was the one in Newport who first became a citizen. Possible they took out their papers where they were at the time. They were not 
last one. Uh, one one of these uh, questions uh, asks, when you first moved in to this house, how long did it take you to feel as though you were part of the neighborhood? I don't think that there was enough change from your no, other... We were immediately adopted, as it were, by Mrs. Hazard, because she was a member of St. George's Church, so she knew us before we came to live next door to her. Whereas, uh, as soon as the uh, Rogers left the house, Baptist moved in That's next right. door to you. <laughs> yeah. And then it changed to Episcopalian again. Uh, what, do, what do you like most about your neighborhood? And what do you like least about your neighborhood? <laughs> well, I think what I like most is the relationship we have with the neighbors. We're not always in each other's hair, but when need arises, we are there. Uh, I have known some of them through the schools. Uh, we had a funny thing happen the other day. Perhaps this should be included right now. We had a bird flying around the laundry after you left me the other day, and I went to hang the clothes from the washing machine. I went into the laundry, and there was this bird swallowing flying around. That terrifies I quickly closed the door came up to her and she said, oh, call Carlton, Carlton be the guy. So when I got his house, his wife said, yes, yeah, she knew she called him TPA. She said, it won't be very long. Well, that turned out not to be true, but he did come around just after three, because I couldn't reach, and furthermore, I thought the window would be stuck with the painting, you see, but Carlton managed to get the window open directly open it, of course, the bird was delighted that you knew right out. But uh, I was telling Dick Lee, our neighbor on the K Street, about it. Why didn't you call me? I said, because you were at work. I would have called you. Well, he said, you could have called Arthur. Arthur's his boy, but I don't know whether he would have come over or not. But that but is nice to know. Very nice to know. And the people in the former Hazard House, Mrs. Botari and her two daughters, said countless times, you need anything, let us know. Uh, we don't see them from one month to another, except to say go out. But we know they're there. And one night we did lose our telephone. And I came to your house, but I don't know whether you were in or not, but I didn't get any answer. So when I went to her house, and she helped, and oh, she gave the telephone people a piece of her mind of two elderly ladies should not be without a telephone overnight. <laughs> so we have that feeling in the neighborhood without being so intimate over the cup of coffee and so forth and so on. No, I don't think that uh, this neighborhood is a very borrowing of eggs that no, we hear about in, very in, in other neighborhoods, but a very, very close, warm feeling right. to know that it's there. Mm -hmm. Now, you haven't told me what you don't like about the neighborhood, if there's anything you don't well, like. I don't can't think, really, except the wall across the street with all its graffiti. But to give the owner his due, they have tried to keep it nice. And, of course, I know he had a letter in the paper complaining about the neighbors not informing the police of what was going on. But, of course, we can't hear. And the latest inscription came, I know, New Year's Eve. That Linda, I love always, Michael, was New Year's Eve. I suspect that some of the rest of it 
is due to the children who wait for the bus on the corner of K and Rotary, the school bus, because they have, uh, well, they, I've seen them uh, sort of maneuvering, but not actually writing. But I suspect they're responsible for some of them. Uh, last summer, it was better than summers before, I think, as far as its use as a playground was concerned. But uh, I uh, have really no complaints about the neighborhood, <laughs> other than the graffiti. I think that about closes up our immediate neighborhood. How about your participation in the wider community? I think maybe this might be the time that we would go into your, uh, when, you, when you left uh, Rogers High School, Tell me uh, where you went to college, and tell me a little of your reminiscences about your successes, if there were any failures, which I doubt, at college, and your coming back to Newport and starting your educational career. Well, I went from Rogers directly to Wellesley and graduated Wellesley in 1926 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. My major at Wellesley was botany. They didn't in those days have a biology major. We either took botany or zoology. My minor was mathematics. In order to get all the science I wanted at Wellesley, I couldn't get an animal course, zoology. So at the end of my junior year, I went to summer school at Cornell University. And so I could get the zoology course there. And just to fill out the program, I took the history of education course. Well, I was very glad I did because that would help me get my certificate to teach in Rhode Island. Had you had in the back of your mind that you would like to teach? Yes. Ever since I was a little girl, I felt that I wanted to teach. I thought at first it would be Latin, but then I steered away from Latin four years of high school, never took any more. At uh, Wellesley, I did some uh, community work in Boston. I had a Girl Scout troop at one of the social service agencies. You can call them clubs in those days. Just, well, just houses where activities were conducted. So I used to take the train into Boston one afternoon a week for my girls' country. On campus, I believe it or not, was on the volleyball team. <laughs> we had to take two years of phys ed there. And after that, it was optional. As I look back, I wish I'd gone a little later so I would have had the benefit of the swimming pool, but that was not to be. It seemed to me our class got all of the unpleasant things, at least they were unpleasant to us in those days, and acquired subjects. One course that everyone suffered. When I left, graduated from Wellesley, I went to New Hampshire to teach for a year. 
in Repeat, thing, repeat that again now. When you when I Wilson. graduated from Wilson, I went to New Hampshire to teach for one year. I was a science instructor at what was then called Keene Normal School. Now it is Keene State College uh, of New Hampshire post-secondary system. Uh, I have a lovely time up there, lots of activity, and I was all set to return for another year, sign a contract. And well, it was a time when in Newport, the ninth grade in the elementary school was being eliminated, put in to the high school. In other words, instead of 13 years of public education, there would be only 12. That meant that the ninth grade, the new ninth grade at Rogers High School, require people qualified to teach different subjects than the former ninth grade teachers had been teaching. And so, in 1927, there was a big influx of new faculty at Rogers. Our former principal, Mr. Fred P. Weber, urged me to apply. I said, Mr. Weber, I've signed a contract in the key. Well, see if they will allow you to break it. So I went up to Keene to see if I could break my contract, and as a result, I spent the rest of the summer there teaching in their summer school, because due to increased enrollment, they needed another science teacher. But I was released from my contract, and so... In 1927, September 27, I began my long tour of duty at Rogers High School. Because from 27 to 1975, I witnessed many, many changes. Personnel and also in teaching methods, curriculum, lots and lots of changes. I lasted, outlasted, what, what did I figure one day? I think it was five principles. I would love to uh, have you try to evaluate the caliber of teachers at that first 10 or 15 years with what you may have been with the last 10 or 15 years, if, if you don't mind. Uh, you don't have to give their names, but there were some outstanding teachers along the line in those early years. Very true. And of course, I think they were fully devoted to their work, which I wonder if that pertains today. The pay was not high by any means. I started in Newport at $1,800 a year. So the near pittance today, even with the evaluation of the dollar. Uh, yet I felt I was wealthy because that was more than I was going to receive in my second year at Keene. Of course, I did have board and room provided at Keene. As part of that, I had to be a supervisor in a small dormitory of some 10 or 15 girls. So I can't say that it was commensurate with the duties anyway. The proverbial dormitory food was a heavy thing to write all about. Either. But, so it was to my advantage to come home, and then I felt that I was able to go of this house. This is 
savings for the income of the patrons who become such thing as social security, anything like that. So, uh, home I came. The teachers, I think, treated me at first as a little girl because I had had so many of them when I was a pupil. But I don't mean that they belittled me, but they were just going to bring me up in the straight and narrow profession. Uh, I had went in through the back department, which might be considered a back door as it was major of college, but uh, Ms. Hoffman, head of the department, had taught me, and so when she found I was available, she hired me. That was not the case with Mr. Greenlaw, head of the science department. He was not at all in favor of having a woman, because he'd had previously two women who were not as reliable as Mr. Greenlaw thought they should be. Even in his funeral, he was stern manner and attention to business attitude. So, for the first year I taught up the math, then he needed a science teacher for one class in the second, my second year. So I was nominated to teach that general science class, four math classes to go along. Apparently he was satisfied because gradually the third year I was nothing but science, nothing but science ever since. All the way from um, general science, biology, general ecology, household science we called it, a science course for junior girls in the professional department. Then Oh, now it must be what, 30, 35 years ago, we put in a special course aimed at nursing candidates for physiology. Started out as half a year, but then we were able to get it in for the whole year. And they tell me that it really is valuable to those going on to nursing school. Is that an, a unique course in uh, your uh, well, Middletown teaches it, too, but I don't think their aim is quite the same, from what I understand. They do aim it at nurses. So, I have a Christmas card on which a message was written saying, I met a girl from Sandy Point Avenue. So she had you in physiology at Rogers. She's a nurse, and oh boy, did she appreciate your course. I feel it gives them vocabulary and nothing else. I enjoyed that because I started it and developed it with the nurse in mind. Now tell me the, the title, the, the subject title, as it is now. Physiology. And it is mostly taken by the girls, but the boys... Boys do take it too. During my tenure, I had one boy. He wanted to go into physio, to uh, physical education, but he didn't last in college. He just dropped out after his first year. He tells me he's going back, but I don't know if he ever will. But of course, he was the kingpin of the class. All the girls adored having him in the class. So he really was. Almost King turned his head, to maybe kept him from being so successful after he left. I don't know. Uh, you mentioned um, two uh, heads of departments. I think it would be nice for the record of the Historical Society to have you uh, reminisce about some of those other early teachers at Rogers who were distinguished people and whom we have not had a chance to interview. Well, there were two that come to mind, first of all, are Miss Ruth Franklin and Miss uh, Susan Franklin. I 
had both in ancient history. And let's serve them for third and fourth year planting. They were very strong personalities, especially the way different from the Dean of Girls. And Miss Susan learned about her strengths from a choir me. She was just like a little doll, even in the classroom. And no one would dare misbehave in her class. But Miss Hickey should be mentioned. I never had Miss Hickey because she taught American history. And I don't took more history. Miss Stenhouse, who taught the country. Eva sends me in there. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Greenlaw, I mentioned, he was really very helpful to me, although he was so rough and stern. Sometimes I wondered just how I stood with him, and then I'd talk to somebody else and would find out secondhand what his reactions were. Uh, Perhaps I should also mention one teacher by nickname, because I really can't remember his real first name, and that was Bruce Stevens. So named because he's disciplined. <laughs> we liked the girls, so when I had him in geometry, everything was fine. The boys, he was very strict. There was another uh, uh, geometry teacher, uh, Louis Chase. Louis Chase, oh yes, and Louis Chase should be remembered too, because he founded the orchestra. And my brother Stuart played in the orchestra. At the beginning, he had a little small organ, not a portable organ such as they have today. But he would strap that on his back when they went out to play everything. He was very interested. He taught himself the cornet. I can remember one time he had his own father. But uh, Howard was in the orchestra and so was Charlie Hughes. But he really had some fun. Of course, all of that was a labor of love on Louis Chase's part. But today, you wouldn't get that. They'd expect to be paid. That's as the uh, class advisors are paid today. For 25 years, I supervised the senior class activities, including the publication of the yearbook for Binnacle. And no, and no extra pay. Pay, no hour time, pay. No, and no time uh, during the day to work on. Your own time. So that when I became head of department, I gave it a pay. It was just too, too much along with the department. We were losing our principal. The new one was, had not yet been appointed, so I thought, well, now is the time to resign because there'll be no hard feelings, it won't be interpreted that I don't really want to work with Mr. So and so, who's going to be the next principal. It just seemed the right time. For 25 years. It was fun, I'm not saying it was, and then I got to know some of the youngsters very intimately, like the editors and the business managers, especially. I say the difference you ask about the difference in attitudes of teachers today is one striking example. If a teacher was taken ill, or if for any reason a class had to be covered, we asked, we asked to do it. We tried to keep it within the department. But now I understand the Teachers Association demands that a teacher report that. And then that teacher is paid for the time she substitutes for the other teacher, which I think is disgraceful. And gets the same extra substitute pay that the... Well, it 
substitute. Well, they teacher. have some sort of a formula that if you teach six periods instead of five, supervise a class, you do not necessarily teaching, you may be just babysitting, but you get one fifth extra for your day's pay, which I think is disgraceful. Well, I think that uh, I think unions have done a lot for labor. I don't consider teaching a trade as a profession. That respect and also filing grievances and teaching conditions. Uh, one case where uh, 25 women was raised to 26. It's an absolute reason. It certainly has been part of the problem, I think, in our downward trend in education, I cannot believe that the intelligent quotients of our people are lowering the way we are told that they are lowering. I think it must be that they have not got the proper groundwork, they have not been handled by dedicated teachers. I think that's partly responsible. I also think, of course, that it's largely due to lack of respect for the pupils for the teachers, and to some extent, lack of respect of teachers for pupils. Well, I think that the disciplining must be the a, the, the lack of discipline must be the basic problem. Of course, will be said in favor of the teachers today, it must be very difficult to institute the discipline that you know is, should be instituted. Because before you know it, you will be in the clutches of the AC and you. I can remember the days of one of our stronger principles, the ACLU, informing them that they had absolutely no right to request a pupil to cut his hair, which was showed them in the beginning of the long hair males. And uh, his hands were taken, he could have been taken to court. I think when they started to write out students' rights, it was a big mistake. I don't believe that it should be do as I say, discipline. If there's mutual respect, we won't have discipline problems. And another thing, I think if you keep the youngsters busy, you know. Were you able, I think in science, you probably have more interest or can instill more interest in your students maybe than uh, some of the uh, other disciplines. Uh, did you have very many problems over oh, the years? I had my share. Yes, I think I had my share. The year before I retired, I had the worst class I had ever. One of my classes was the worst I'd ever experienced. Largely based on attitude and attendance as a general language. I don't believe in more than one or two days in the whole school year. We just try to get the work made up. Flunking the whole uh, a large number because they had the problem. Were your the hands tired so that you could not flunk those? No, I flunked them. 
I never heard anything about it. Maybe they were afraid to approach me. I don't know. But I understand some people were scared of me, and I don't know why. And that may be that. The, the way you kept the yeah, other classes. The <laughs> yes. But uh, I... Uh, Yes, I wasn't too much of an ogre, because when I'm in the market today, gone, so often people will come up and say, how are you, and so forth. And that's really very embarrassing to me, because I don't remember some of them at all. Tell me some of those that you are uh, proud of and uh, feel are your children. Oh, there are lots of them. Admiral Coogan, for one. Bobby Cooper, Ed Gladding, one of the high-level scientists with DuPont, I don't, I don't, I don't mean that they have to be uh, so well known, but in in your your feelings about them that they have. Uh, well. Of course, <laughs> I have always maintained, and I don't care what a youngster does it as long as he does it to the best of his ability. And so I feel I do not underrate or devalue the contribution of our garbage man. Because we've been through times when we wish we had. And I think we maintain a reasonable attitude with them and give them good service. So that uh, I suppose I've had some success with that. I have a black man now told me, he knew me, I don't know who he is. He packs your garbage and he's leave us and he has it very nice because he doesn't take the can out unless it's really overflowing. So uh, that's something to be thankful for. I don't have to tote it in. I'm sure that is not solely because you taught him. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe school. not. Maybe he doesn't want to carry it out too. <laughs> but at least you are known uh, to him, which is yes. is very interesting. And uh, these people that you do see. Uh, on the street after all of these years. Oh, yes. Yeah. Obviously, you couldn't possibly, since they change and you don't change. That's it. That's the problem, you see. They grow up. And, well, some of them are grandmothers. I met on, on Saturday. And she said, You know, I'm a grandmother now. Well, I could hardly believe it. But I did get her name right. So but she hadn't changed that much and it suddenly came to me. I find it more difficult now to remember than I did eight years ago. Of course, because you have whole... I haven't had to remember. Yes, this. and your and your your life has has changed in retirement. Yeah. Well, now tell me, are you one of those disappointed people in retirement, or oh, do you indeed. find that you no, have plenty no. to keep you busy? Well, I really don't know how I had time to go to work. I owe more letters that I should. Read. Oh, two to former teachers. I thought, well, I haven't seen them for so long. I guess I'll drop Christmas cards this year. But they didn't. They sent me round robin letters. One of them was very uh, appreciated, although I did send to them. It was a black woman, I think, a teacher. One of the most stylish dresses in the whole school. An excellent teacher, and her husband is in the Navy, so she only stayed with us a little while. One of those years, she was transferred to Thompson, teaching general science. And now her husband is a captain, the head of the supply depot at School of Day in the Philippines. She worked here from the Philippines. And strangely enough, she was evidently sent to Texas College as a satellite campus there. She was teaching in that satellite campus with a little woman. Isn't it a small, very, very small world? Yeah. 
pena que ela tem. Tá muito pena que ela tem. Eu estou segura com seus... Many extra hours spent uh, in your duties and volunteer hours at Rogers. You didn't have time to join many civic organizations, but do you belong to any civic organization? Yes, I have a lot of historical society, as you know, and the preservation society. Retired teachers of Newport, also a civic profession, and our TA division of AARP, happy local. Never uh, been uh, mixed up in uh, politics, never had That's any desire. No, no desire whatsoever. People have asked me. They retired. They said, run for school committee, run for school committee. Nothing doing. Nothing doing. And, of course, I have not been on the substitute teaching list. Once I settled my connections, that's it. So I don't want to be down in any situation where people will think I'm probing to see what's going on. Uh, do you think our Newport school system has... Uh, much politics yeah. in it. Yeah. Do you think it would ever be possible for a school system not to have politics? Well, I think it would be very difficult. I think a community the size of Newport is likely to be more apparent than in a natural system. You see, everybody lives, well, not everybody, Most teachers live on the island. We have a few that live across the Narragansett Bay. South Kingston, North Kingston, commute. We did have one commuting from Toronto, but he has moved here. And uh, so, but I think otherwise, everybody knows everybody's parents. So when your name is known, you're a candidate for a job. I think that stands in my stand. Well, I, I don't think that is objectionably bad. No. no. It might make a little bit of an inbred breeding that you wouldn't get if it were easier for the outside people to come in. Yeah. But I think for this small, when we really think how small our area is, What would your feeling be if ever a Quidneck Island could be combined in I a school? I think the regionalization should have been done in the present Rogers High School was built from the years ago. But we don't. You now realize that that building has been occupied for 27 years now. So I think it shows remarkable But it does seem for a hundred thousand inhabitants, three separate systems yeah. are very. Very could, expensive to yes, maintain. And of course, they could have far more options. I say that, but I'm not so sure they could now with this new basic requirements of the curriculum. I think some of that is ridiculous, too, because the needs of this island are very different from the city of Providence. And yet, they're going to have two tracks, from what I understand. Those going to college and those not going to college. And it's going to be very difficult for anyone to transfer to the other track. That is almost going back to earlier days, isn't mm -hmm. it? When there were the distinct I have differences. One big 
thing in a person in mind, too, who went on, named him probably among the few successful pupils, was Donald Johnstone, the son of Mr. Fred Johnstone, his father Rogers principal. Donald was taking a vocational course. And he decided that he wanted to go to college. So he had to take a fifth year in high school in order to get college units. I had him in biology, which he just ate up. So he was admitted to URI with the courses he took in his fifth year, balancing out the previous four years. I want to be sure that we get into the to the part that uh, the, the tape that doesn't take for about three or four on the market here. I don't like the way that's going. Uh, not fixing it. You want to? Sure. Um, so I can get on the computer. Now, Miss North, we are going to start uh, reminiscing about World War One. In the summer of 1916, uh, I suppose with your British background, it made much more of an, an impression on you that there was war in Europe than it did for most new quarters. In 1916, tell me if you remember the, uh, the news that would come from Europe. Well, I remember that many of my cousins enlisted in the British Army. Uh, actually, before 1916, shortly after the war was declared in 1914, we did our share over here by going to old dressings. I can't recall the exact title it had, English or British, in the title of the organization. But we used to go to a storefront that was where the Vogue shop and adjacent stores are now. And we'd hold compresses, roll bandages, and that sort of thing. Then later, I think this must have been after the United States got into the conflict. We worked for the Red Cross in a similar capacity. And also, at that time, to raise funds, the Red Cross would sell the daily news on the main artery. My sister and I would be dressed up in long white robes, I guess you could call them, of the Red Cross, with the headdress, with the little Red Cross on the front. And we would go down 10th Street at the time when the shift of the torpedo station was coming in on the ferry and sell these newspapers. The price of the newspaper was two cents. But, of course, you got a great deal more than that, sometimes a whole dollar. I can't recall we ever knew just what our receipts were because the money was put into canister. I'm afraid, perhaps I didn't realize so much the significance of it. I thought it was fun. Uh, the actual stories of war came to us from two sources, letters from England as well as the newspaper, naturally not radio or television, because we did not get our first radio until 1924. Of uh, course, I was not in school at the time, so I really don't know what the reactions of youngsters of my age were at that time. 
How about uh, when you uh, did uh, realize that we had declared war? Uh, were you too young to uh, have very much reaction to that? No, I think I realized the seriousness of it. And uh, directly, some of the men from Newport started to be drafted. <coughs> Excuse me. We, it brought it all home to us because we knew the men who were going, who were going into the service. Now, were these, uh, any of those your neighborhood <coughs> men, or did you not uh, really know what parts of the town they came from? Well, uh, and there, there was, of course, the uh, hopping up of the uh, recruiting. So Newport did increase its population through the recruits. Were you aware of the Navy recruiting? Yes, I think we were, was, because we would go over to the training station to see them drill on the lawn in front of the sole building then of the war college. And that was really a great treat because we had to go over there on a trolley car. We had no car transportation at that time. So that was one of our summer activity. Do you remember what day of week those drills were? I think they I were. Think they, I think you're right. They were on Wednesdays, I believe. Um, do you uh, remember that anyone from your neighborhood uh, went to the torpedo station in uh, any capacity? Of course, the women went too, didn't they? Not in World War One, I, I believe, did they? I can't recall. I know they did in World War Two. We had a uh, uh, yeoman, and I just wondered if they, any of them became yeoman. I knew some young women who entered the uh, service as yeoman, uh, but I didn't know that until much later, because the uh, names would come up. I remember reading in the paper about casualties, too, after the boys went overseas. Of course, you would read about the escorts, the cargo ships, passenger liners in the Atlantic. Uh, I've heard that there were some uh, clam bake tales for the sailors on Broadway. Were you ever aware of that? No, I can't say I was aware of that. But I do remember that they had lock dances on Washington Square. And anyone in the community would attend. Except my mother would never allow me to go thought I was too young. Did the brothers go, do you know? I don't think they did. I can't recall what they did. It probably was for the sailors. Yes, very definitely. Uh, there was no uh, Y. There was no Army-Navy Y at that time. Uh, did you ever hear any discussion of their uh, raising funds to... to that no, building. I don't. I thought most of the funds were provided by Mrs. Thomas Emery. I can't actually recall when that was built, because it has seemed to me a fixture in my memory for so many years. But it certainly served a wonderful purpose when it went into operation. Do you uh, know of any other Red Cross activities besides those you took part in uh, during this time? I'm afraid I don't. Can you remember when Admiral Sims came home or when uh, the, any of the servicemen uh, came home from the war? 
very definitely because, of course, we lived so near the Sims on K Street. They lived at the corner of K and Man Avenue. And I was good friends with Margaret. She was the, she was oldest. the oldest girl. I knew the others, but I was not as intimate with them because we, she was a year behind me in high school. She was also in the Girl Scouts. So it was, it was great rejoicing when the Admiral came home, as you may well imagine. Perhaps I should go back a little bit and say that our house on K Street had a large porch on the second floor. And on that porch, Miss Campbell Stewart, my godmother, had mounted rackets for flags. And with the United States flag in the center, for other flags of the Allied nations were flown practically every day. This seemed a bit ironic because we were given to understand that the house at that time was actually owned by a German. The daughter of the original owner who had married into the German family. So many people would remark on that fact. But it was interesting, to say the least. And must have been a lovely sight on K Street well, to show the patriotism of you English people. Right. Uh, the house had a very long circular driveway. And so, although there were trees bordering on the sidewalk on K Street, there was enough space in between so that the flag showed off beautifully. And so, um, definitely your K Street was very well aware of the war going on and it being over. Um, Armistice Day probably was something that you might remember. I was in high school at the time and I can remember the great rejoicing all the way down from what I now call the old Rogers building to Washington Square. Another reminiscence of World War One was our living conditions. The house was heated by two hot air furnaces for the major living portion and a hot water furnace system for the servants' quarters. So when coal became short, the family moved into the servants' quarters for the winter. It was very, very cramped, but we survived and certainly were able to keep warm in spite of the rationing of coal. We should never have had enough coal to stoke all the furnaces. I suppose the pipes were drained in the front section, but I really don't know. It must have been a separate system as far as plumbing was concerned. Did you have a separate furnace man? Who we came did. In? A well known person who served many families, Michael Supplay, <coughs> whose son still lives around. He was an Irishman to the hill, and he came every day, and in the summer, you see, he did the garden, so he was really employed full-time. I think that uh, we'll compare uh, any 
feelings you might have about the homecoming in 1920 with the homecoming after these other wars or incidents we've gone on. But let's move on to anything that you might um, want to tell us about um, life in Newport during the heyday of the summer colony, uh, whether you were aware that the Newporters living in uh, your section of town were affected at all by this society and, and how you were aware of how town Newporters uh, related to the summer colony, if there's anything that you can think of that you might like to put on the record. Well, I don't know that I can associate it with the summer colony, but it was true that people from the neighborhood would pay a visit formally with Miss Campbell Stewart. And afternoon tea was a regular ritual. Alfred Tuckerman who lived at the corner of K and Essex Street. Uh, members of the Ennis family, the General and Mrs. Ennis, would be among her callers. Others came. There was someone, and I can't think of the name, and I'm not sure if it was Mrs. Hayden. That name rings a bell for me, who lived up here on Rhode Island Avenue. And uh, I suppose those are about the only names I recall. But it was uh, someone came in to visit almost every day. The tea table was always set up. Right. Always at home. Yes. While she was in good health. Yes. And of course... She didn't go out too much at that time. Uh, when she did go out, it was mostly to church. And Mr. Robeson, Lloyd Robeson's father, would bring the carriage right up to the front door and drive her to church. As a little girl, I was the one who accompanied her. I don't know if they thought I was too frail to walk, so all the rest of the family walked to St. George's. When did um, your household get their first automobile, if you can remember? 1924. Uh, mother would see to it that Amelia and I went to the beach, she thought it was good by her. And at times we would go on our bicycles, and at times we'd walk. Well, in the hot summer weather, it was a long walk. And so, Mother decided to buy a car. Of course, Cornelia and all of us, in fact, were old enough to drive. My first car was a Dodge, purchased from Justin Crane, who then had a garage on Mill Street. And he taught Mother to drive. Not that she ever did drive, but at least she had the lessons. And then gradually the rest of us went into the car behind the wheel. And I can remember Stuart helping me on Gibbs Avenue. He made me turn around in the middle of the street, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but he got me out of the jam. And so we all got our licenses, and that was it. I'd love to uh, have you describe that particular model of Dodge, because it... I imagine it was one of those that all of our age can remember. Well, it was a four-door sedan. And I tease her about it now because 
my mother was going to select the car. Amelia said, oh, we don't want a sedan. We want a limousine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny what young people will do. And then uh, a chauffeur had to be engaged, or was there somebody oh, no. in the family? Oh, everybody, everybody did this. Yes, except my mother. She held on to a driver's license for years, but never really drove, because somebody else was always there to drive. Did Miss Collings uh, no. learn to drive? No. And uh, Miss Deer did not learn to drive. Now, was the Four River Line anything in your life? Yes, because we'd go down not too frequently to New York, and I can never remember going by train. It was always the old Four River Line. My last trip on the Four River Line was a very scary one. The father had frozen over, you could walk to the torpedo station on the ice. Can you remember what year this might have been? Well, I was 20, say, 22. Oh, no, no, no. Because I was teaching at the time. I think it would have been more around 1930 or so. Because it was during a spring vacation. And it turned very, very cold. But mother and I, and I think little Alice went to, went down to New York. For pleasure. We went down in uh, bad weather, actually freezing in the ice block of the harbor. That night it was fine. We stayed in New York five or six days. When we returned to get the boat back, we learned that it hadn't been out of the harbor since because of ice. That night I never slept a wink because with the old paddle wheels turned, you could hear them crunching the ice, and I expected to have a wreck any minute whatsoever. My mother slept well, and yet she was a rather nervous person when it came to such experiences. But I was the one who was scared. Uh, I wonder if uh, a little description of the inside of one of those, the Commonwealth or the Plymouth, uh, wouldn't wouldn't be uh, fun it, for you to highlight what you remembered most about. Uh, the inside. Well, I the remember system. the red velvet covered chairs and settees and the rather ornate decorations in what I believe they called the Grand Lounge. Uh, coming back from New York, of course, we ate in the dining room, which uh, gave what to me, was rather formal service with the white-coated waiters with the napkins over their arms and so forth. I can't say that I remember that the food was spectacularly good, but at least it satisfied us because, of course, you boarded the boat in New York at four o'clock and got off here at about two or three in the morning. And to get from uh, the boat landing to this house in 1930, of course, we had to take a taxi. But there were always taxis available down there. Another experience I recall before 1930, about 1928, that was the winter when Miss Collins contracted pneumonia, and she was not expected to survive. So two of her sisters came over from England, and that Thanksgiving, a friend of mine from New Hampshire, who was here over the holiday period, and I were supposed to go to New York 
to meet me. Well, it was a very, very bad stormy night, and the boat would not leave because of treacherous conditions. So we, the two of us, took a taxi to Providence and went by train. And we got there in time to meet the liner coming in. Of course, they did not fly and came by boat. But we had all sorts of passes to get down to the docks to meet them. But uh, $15, which was really cheap to go to Providence by taxi. Cheap at least by today's standards. There was a man in the taxi with us, I know, who decided to wait because they kept on saying, well, the boat might leave, the boat might leave. But of course, we wanted to get there to meet them. That was your only experience on a night train? Yes, well, it really wasn't a night train. I mean, as far as the birth was concerned, no, we just sat up all night and probably dozed. Uh, when the Fall River Line uh, was abandoned, uh, were you aware of any of the uh, depression at the, at the dock? Uh, we are going to go into... Uh, your memories of uh, the Depression, uh, were you aware that there were Fall River, sh uh, that shops were being, uh, were supplying all the services that were needed at that time to the boat? Do you remember hearing about the strike? No, I can't say that I do. The, the Fall River line just disappeared in your life because you didn't go down to New York on it. Anymore, it didn't me that said it didn't. It didn't. Well, of course, I used to hear about it from William King Cobo because he was a colleague on the Rogers faculty at that time, and he would frequently get presentations from his memorabilia. We've lost some great historians, haven't we? Indeed, we have. At Lloyd Roost and King Colvin. Well, did the stock market crash uh, affect you or your extended family? No, I don't think it did, because at that time we were not into the market. Our savings were deposited in the Newport Savings Bank. I had my original bank book around there. Opened, I found open in 1912. Yeah, that is a Um, your, uh, all, all funds were in the, in the savings bank That's and true. nobody in the family were playing the market. No. Uh, was there any uh, change in the um, income uh, of any of the people in that family that you were aware of, or did the household continue? Well, yes, my own income changed because all school teachers had to take a cut. If you were to ask me how much now, I couldn't tell you, but I know it seemed at the time very substantial. Although, of course, the pay at that time was not very great. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a differential between men and women, which was later eliminated. When do you think here in Newport the uh, prices of things comp going down compensated for that percentage of cut. In other words, he took a cut of a percentage. And then didn't the um, commodities that you had to buy go down commensurately with that cut? I don't really remember, because if I wasn't too involved in the 
shopping. Uh, that time, a great deal of uh, commodities came from the two pistol companies. And went from a grocery store run by Cy Williams. I don't know about his grocery store. It was located almost a crunch from the one from Kansas on Broadway. If this would be a nice time to uh, reminisce about those gentlemen grocers all over Newport, which of course is something of the past. Mm -hmm. The Tisdals, and can you remember some others? Well, I remember what we used to call the butter and egg store on 10th Street. And who ran that? I was, I think, a national chain. I don't remember the manager's name. It was located right next door to what was then the Daily News office. A couple of stores away from the government mansion. We used to poke our eggs in our butter, because butter was so sold in bulk rather than in the at, uh, quartered packages of the day. And uh, how uh, you would go and uh, get the fresh butter and eggs. It was customary, however, to have things delivered and the orders were done That's very differently from the way they are now. Yes, Tisdall's would come with an order about every day. Cy Williams did not deliver, but there were products there that other liked. And I have a distinct memory, this was way back. They had some advertising for Horlicks malted milk. And they fascinated me. They were a child in a high chair. I can see that pink dress, white pinafore. Now, he had two sizes, small ones and big ones. They were right on the counter. So I suppose in my little mind, I decided they would be wonderful to play with. So I grabbed a handful of each size and took them home. And my mother saw it. You can't have all those. So she made me keep just one of each and take all the rest back. So my anticipation of what play fun was shattered. I remember how I was scared to tell Mr. Williams. <laughs> that was the, the last uh, time that you shoplifted I hope so. <laughs> I think that salaried people were so uh, fortunate in the Depression, those that kept their jobs, that uh, it is difficult to realize all those whose jobs were eliminated or who had um, very, very difficult problems, and it makes us feel a little embarrassed that it didn't hurt us. Very true. Because of the ones, the, they may have been speculators, but we did not have in Newport, I, or do you think we had the same sort of thing as selling apples and pencils we on the We did. I was just going to mention that. It was not an uncommon sight to find apple sellers right outside the high school on Broadway. I didn't know that. Yeah. I won't say on a daily basis, but we used to have. So you were aware that oh, there were right. people in the town that yes. had uh, been seriously hurt. Now, we haven't established what your feelings about alcohol are, but what are your memories, the earliest memories of prohibition? <laughs> well, I really can't tell you that. I am not a total abstinence person by any means, but I believe in the big M, 
moderation so that uh, and I think people have to realize too that one individual may be very different from another in the tolerance level. You weren't old enough to remember any discussion about the 18th Amendment being ratified. No, I can't say that I did. I have one stray, a funny story, though. I mentioned earlier that McCollins had pneumonia. And at that time, the doctor said, and this was Dr. Young, that it would be good for her to have milk mixed with some whiskey. Now, she was not a drinker. She just didn't like the stuff. But if she was going to get well, she said that would help her a great deal. Well, we had none in the house. But a rather prominent law officer who was a member of St. George's Church came to this front door one day and asked me, he was in the hall of the year, near the winter, I guess, asked me if he could come in. Why he wanted to come in. With that, he stood in the vestibule, and from his big, big coat pocket, took out a bottle. So said, I understand. This would help Miss Collins. This was some that I confiscated. <laughs> Well, you know, she got that she liked it. And when the doctor said, well, give her milk only, she told my no, she didn't like that taste. She wanted the good stuff in it. But of course, there was a lot of bootleg whiskey around. But frankly, we didn't know how to get it, and we wouldn't trust the quality of it anyway. But it was strange that this, I better not mention his name. All right, all right. A stalwart citizen, anyway. That's right. Uh, I suppose that um, that particular man uh, was really up to his ears in uh, knowing about the rum running and everything. I also know that the newspapers would tell which folks had been confiscated That's and, right. and you only uh, got your information from the newspapers I True. suppose you didn't know, didn't uh, know anyone involved that no. was involved <laughs> no smugglers no. Uh, here is a question were there any speakeasies in your neighborhood no fortunately no uh, was there a neighborhood uh, in town where such activities as uh, speakeasies and maybe uh, some of the rum runners gathered, were you aware that we had? Oh, I think I was aware going. there were areas of the town, but it would be very difficult for me to pinpoint them. And did you ever know of anyone who made home brew, made beer at home even, or wine at home? I made some wine. <laughs> Which, of course, was not against the law. And this goes back to the, around the 1920s. Cornelia had a friend from the conservatory as a house guest. And Mother, one evening, said that she wanted them to taste her wine. So she went down cellar. Well, Mother was not one to really label things carefully. She got a bottle. She poured it out. And when the girls tasted it, they kind of made some faces. Instead of wine, she had brought out maple syrup. <laughs> we used to get maple syrup syrup in large cans and then bottle it to make it easier to handle. <laughs> but they didn't get uh, the taste of the wine, so then of course another bottle had to be broken out that was wine. I don't uh, know why it would be important whether you uh, feel that some people wanted prohibition and some didn't want it. It was there, and I wouldn't have thought you would 
have very much discussion. No, I can't recall or against, against it. it. Where were you when the 1938 hurricane hit Newport? Well, the 1938 hurricane, the afternoon before, uh, Carlo, the friends, and I were going up to Hilltop Restaurant in, uh, well, I guess it would be near the hospital, would that be Seacon, Rehoboth, somewhere around there. One of the party's husband worked over at the War College because he was in the Navy at the time. I came home from school and was getting ready when the telephone started to ring. And so Owen said he can't get over here because the causeway is underwater. So naturally, the date was all called off. Then I worried because Camellia and um, Alice and Mother were not in the house and the car was not in the garage. My mother had decided, to me to have them out for a ride, she decided she wanted to go on the ocean drive. Not realizing the ferocity of the storm. So they had to pick their way home, going from one street to another to avoid fallen trees. They finally got home. Well, Miss Collings, of course, was still at school. How she made it, I don't know, but she came from a school on 18 Rhode Island Avenue, accompanied by Agatha Sheffield, whose father could not get in from Middletown to take her home. Or he couldn't get to Middletown, I'm not sure which. But anyway, they got down to this house. They were able to feed everybody and then eventually Mr. Sheffield came and picked up Agatha. Well, of course, conditions the next morning meant absolutely no school for me. So Cornelia and I went over to Third Beach to see what the situation was because at that time we occupied one of Mrs. Cheerio's Cabanas. Well, we found that up in the field, which is now the parking lot behind the front row of bathhouses. I can't recall how I was dressed. I wished I were dressed as I am now with something over my legs, because I came out of that hurricane experience with a terrible case of poison ivy in my It took me about six months to get over it. You'd never been allergic before? Oh, yes, I had, but I had not been attacked by it for, well, that was 38, about 20 years. So I never thought of poison ivy. We rescued what we could from the Campania. And, uh, of course, fortunately, here we have a cup of any damage. Well, uh, Dr. Rogers lost one tree that came down over our sun porch, but it was minor damage, it was only the way around the sun porch. We were back in school the next day uh, on the actual aftermath. Of we were back in school. Then my poison ivy started off. I had to take spare stockings to school, have pads on the legs. Finally, Dr. Young said, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to try some injections. And eventually, about six months later, I I hope you've never been in the fields since. I avoided it. Did any of your uh, pupils uh, lose their lives. Uh, I think those Jamestown children that lost their lives may have been the only 
yes. uh, loss of life uh, yes. amongst the... Well, of course, there was some students. loss of life down by the beach, and there were many heroics performed down by the beach. But I recall Archie Daly rescuing some Catholic priests from a car down by the beach. Yeah. And Archie lived on uh, Annandale Road. To go back to the naval officer who could not come back across the causeway, was there any word, do you think, to his wife that it was a hurricane? I think so, I knew it was a hurricane. I think so. Because the rest of the civilian population had no idea, idea what kind no. of storm it was, but the naval Yes. People. I think she might have known it was. I don't know that we ever discussed it. But at least we knew we shouldn't go to Seacon. I'm glad you didn't. Uh, the next day, of course, he asked people to keep off the streets as much as possible. But we wanted to know how a friend out in Portsmouth was doing. The so wires were down. But there yeah, some of us... Uh, did get in the car and go out there and see what Island Park looked like. That was well, almost swept away, wasn't yeah. it? And of course we went down the avenue to see Bailey's Beach Rotunda in the middle of the road. But uh, I don't think we have had any operations or clean up. Uh, we didn't intend to. Uh, when you're young and daring, you do things that your better judgment will prevent you from doing later. Well, it is a very interesting thing that each person who was uh, in any part of New England uh, during that hurricane has such vivid memories of that day. Did the jazz festival in any way affect you? Yes to some extent. The only performance I attended was the second one at Freebody Park. I enjoyed it, although it's not really my favorite type of rhythm. Do you remember any of the performers at that particular second one? No, I believe that. But of course, I do remember the year of the riot. Did you just stay in the house? Indeed I did, and watch all the emergency vehicles go by with sirens blaring and lights flashing. We were scared. We didn't know what, whether the mob was going to come down this street or what was going to happen. So, uh, uh, aside from the vehicles and the noise, uh, how did you know it was the jazz festival? riots when the wagons and fire. Yes, and I'm trying to think. The, the radio, I the radio. Somehow other we found out. They did not come to Rhode Island Avenue. Fortunately. Do you think the festival should have been continued in 72. That was when they went out in the Festival field. field wasn't it? Yeah. And that's when they closed. Was that the year they closed it down before the, all the performances had been given? I don't remember. I don't remember either. There was I think that it's better now that they're having it in daylight, for one thing, and in a place where Hangers on and linger. I think it was not the people who went to the festival as much as those who tried to crash in and hang around, hoping to hear the music. When they were festival filled, they said that Gerard Avenue area was a mess. People would come in their yards and perform in decent acts. Oh, it was terrible, they said. That it seems to have been controlled better now if it's forever and forever. And as I say, being offered in daylight hours 
to someone many times after that. They try to uh, think that their acts will not be visible, and so anything goes. Well, the alcohol problem, of course, that's became true. very bad. Yes, and drugs. And in the daylight, it's a little bit easier to stop that yeah. on state. That's positive. true. Were you the least bit affected by the withdrawal of the fleet from Newport? Only in so far as we lost a lot of pupils at Rogers. But I don't think otherwise I had enough Navy connections to be aware so much of it. Economically, I don't think I was hurt. Amongst those uh, pupils, um, did you lose some of your better pupils, or was there no no difference? No, I don't think there was the any ones ones and the or the ratio of superior to lower level. Of course, we know that other people in business did uh, have a terrible loss. I suppose that had an indirect uh, uh, effect on the youngsters in school. Because of course, comparing it with today, money seems to be the least of their consideration. But I suppose they had to think twice before they had Levi's or signature jeans or anything like that. There was no effect in your neighborhood. No, I can't recall. Did the nature of housing change no. in your neighborhood? Well, I don't think that was responsible for some of the larger houses being made into apartments. I would say that it was. I think that probably happened before. Were you uh, aware of any uh, agencies, uh, government agencies, helping the city to adapt to the withdrawal? Maybe the schools that had to close, the primary schools that are closed now, are a direct result, aren't well, they? Well, I, I suppose so. I, but I think more than the Navy withdrawal, it might be the falling birth rate. Because so much Navy housing now has moved to Middletown. And actually, the fall of all that Cape Cod housing. Then they expanded out into the Green Lane area. That was Middletown rather than Newport. Oh, undoubtedly there has been an effect. Uh, why do you think so many Navy people retired here? Well, I can only say I think it's a real tribute to Newport that they do retire here. I suppose and one reason is the climate. We have at least four seasons, the four seasons of the year. I suppose, too, that although we are not too far from centers of entertainment, and we are rapidly developing our own, they uh, feel that it's a slower pace of life, perhaps, than they would experience in larger cities. But I do feel that it's a new feather in Newport's cap to draw them here when many of them could choose any part of the world that they would feel inclined to live in. Yeah, Newport is their choice, because we do have now the cultural activities, including the highly developed 
music program. We have uh, historical activities sponsored by the Port Historical Preservation Society. We have a lot of opportunities that are probably not taken advantage of by many citizens through speakers at Salve Regina. They have musical events, they have current events, lectures, and so forth, that are open to the public. So I think they, many of them must feel that it's a good, healthy environment. Without the stresses that they might experience in larger cities, I wish I could say that it was what it used to be as far as feeling secure, but we can't say that too much anymore. Maybe the bridges are responsible, I don't know. One more fleet question before we go on to the bridges and the ferries. Did you ever go downtown on Thames Street on a Friday or Saturday night when the fleet was here? <laughs> no, I can't say that I did. For some reason or other, it didn't appeal to me. Uh, do you think in the years since the, the fleet left that there has been very much change in Thames Street? as of the last few years. Oh, I think a huge change. And of course, I don't know if it is a uh, publicized for, but to me, there are more crimes, if I use that word, taking place down there now than when the fleet was here. An entirely different because we group have, of yes, people. We have the shore patrols, and the mere sight of them probably helped. What you read now, it's not from personal experience, that lots and lots of go, things go on in Newport after dark, and the people from, young people from outside the city are told oh, Newport is the place to be on weekends. You mentioned that maybe uh, the bridge allowed, the bridges, allowed people to come in that the ferries discouraged. How often did you use the Newport Jamestown ferry? Well, whenever we needed to go to the island or to the West Bay area, or when we were going on vacation trips. The Schools closed originally at 2 o'clock, the high school closed, and it got later and later until it was about 20 after 2. And often in the spring vacation, a group of us would go toward the south, not always way down south, although we did go to Florida a couple of times for the spring vacation. And it meant a rush for the ferry, certainly wondering if you were going to get on because the number of cars was limited. But usually we made it. I recall one experience that was a bit scary. When we were tied on with just a thin rope behind the car because they couldn't close the line, gates on the stair. We made it. Did you ever have any experiences coming back? Oh, right. waiting in line, I should say. Wondering so. at late whether you were going yes. to make the last one. Very true. Especially the Saunders Town side. Right. Uh, yeah. Some of your pupils at that time were regular um, commuters on oh, the ferry. Yes, indeed, and some of our finest people came from it's very nice uh, to know a few over there because our steward is over there. When he first moved in, 
occupants of the house across the street, a girl called me up and said, I want to know something this morning. Is he related to you? <laughs> and they've been very nice indeed when his pipes froze last winter, they notified us. When he found his house ransacked, I called the police. Fortunately, I had taken him back that day. And I gave the dispatcher the information. They said they'd send an officer. And the officer came and addressed me by name. Well, I didn't think that was funny because I'd given the name before. Oh, yes, I used to know you at Roger. And he said, when Tommy got the call, he said, I wonder if that's anything to Miss North. <laughs> that was Tommy O'Connell who was on the desk that day. So it, it helps to have known them. When did those uh, uh, high school uh, pupils go to the other side? Can you remember what year that was? Maybe it was after the bridge thing. was built, was it? No, oh, yeah. they didn't do it because of oh, no, transportation. Not because of the ferry, no. no, Newport refused to take them because our capacity was getting so great and Newport couldn't accommodate them, only the vocational youngsters. Yes, I would say that it's a good 10, 12 years. At least that I think. It's, it's too bad because they don't have the same feeling toward Newport that they could have. That's as very true. The school that they were very loyal to Newport. And as I say, we had some very fine youngsters. Many of them have stayed in the area. We had a few teachers from there, too. Just as Jamestown has a few Newport people going over there. Uh, how did you feel about uh, the building of the bridge? I think it was a good thing. Were you aware of any of the discussions about where the bridge should be built uh, and where it should come into Newport? As far as your living in this neighborhood, did it make very much difference to I you? I can't say that it did. We know that the area around the bridge presently was very much upset. Okay. How do you think the bridge has changed Newport? Well, it's made Newport much more accessible than it used to be. I think that uh, that's why life has changed a great deal in Newport. Because people will come down here now who uh, just stayed in the Providence area, we'll say, either the East Bay or the West Bay. And uh, they just come to this area more now because they never knew when they'd have to wait for ferries. And the two ferries got expensive. They may think the bridge toll is high, and I suppose it is, actually. But uh, certainly it's no more than the fairy used to be. It did make the Jamestowners, I think, look more away from Newport and more to the other side, which yes. might have changed a little bit the Newport economy, but not to any I don't think extent. to any great extent. But, uh, I know many of the people in Jamestown do go over to Whitford instead of coming to Newport to do their marketing. So that there would be that change. Yes, Excuse me. Oh, that pause didn't do it. When were you first aware that there was a need to change the deteriorating parts of the city? I'm not sure that I was ever aware of it. 
because the old Thames Street had a lot of appeal for me. Uh, of course, I suppose we must keep up with the times. Certainly, the redevelopment in the lower part of the city is very evident and has attracted a great many outsiders come to this area. Modernization, I feel though, should be kept within bounds and some of the developments illustrate a desire to keep the colonial atmosphere while others, both commercial buildings and private homes, are in my estimation monstrosities, especially some of the houses around the Ocean Drive. I think that uh, Rick Marketplace has developed land that was at one time not used very economically because although I did not frequent the wharves behind, behind the stores on 10th Street, I imagine there was a lot of waste space. I can't say that I think it's helped much tax-wise, even though the evaluations have gone up so much in that area, bringing in more money to the city. I suppose time will tell. It depends on what future councils do. When were you um, aware of the historic value of our 18th century heritage, the residential uh, areas that were becoming deteriorating or had deteriorated? Well. Suppose that was at the time that Doris Duke started much of the Newport restoration program, and I began to see some, even some of my friends' houses undergoing restoration. A friend who lives in one of her houses on Pelham Street. done there, and I was so impressed that there's a beautiful garden behind it, absolutely delightful in the summertime, very private, only the neighbors know that it's there, even. and I understand that was practically a junkyard when restoration can't say, though, that I uh, became too aware of the effect that it was going to have, it has had a great effect. Uh, were you aware of those earlier citizens who uh, saved buildings like the uh, White Horse Tavern and Hunter House and really started making the world aware of Newport as having a lot of 18th century buildings that were worth saving. I think that was probably in the time of Mrs. George Warren. I believe she was, has been considered the founder of Newport Preservation Society, and she certainly did heroic work in saving some of the buildings. Of course, 
as they opened up the mansions that gave them a little bit of revenue to work. investments here at the Inn on the Harbor, simply with the idea of 
having available to them places, well, one that is in Australia, I suppose that's the result of the cup races. Except for the nostalgia of having lost uh, old, decayed Thames Street. Have you any other feelings about this restoration and redevelopment? Our latest one uh, down on the, in the Broadway area. Uh, I think the Broadway, West Broadway area is long overdue. I don't know how many people it's displaced, but we oh, wouldn't we wouldn't know about that, but it probably the reaction down there is very and yet decided. if you read of some of the uh, requests before the planning board of, or the board of review, I guess it is, for restoring some of those houses on the streets off West Broadway. It's amazing what they have done to some of them. I mean, look, yeah, they're crowded in, to be sure. They can't help that. But they've had their new coat of paint, and decaying woodwork has been replaced. It's really quite a tribute to them. I suppose there's still a few old automobiles. I think I read a one complaint on that, the man storing old cars practically junk cars on his property. The city will take care of that, I hope. Yeah. For the sake of the neighbors who want to keep their homes nice. I think that whole West Broadway area has instilled a sense of pride into that neighborhood in some people. I think one of the biggest assets is the new community baptist church. Because they are Hustlers to get in their funds, which is still paying for the church. Really, I know someone who went to the day of prayer and she said, it's, it's really wonderful what they have done. And they're still trying to improve conditions. She expressed it. I wouldn't be afraid to walk down, walk down West Broadway after that. No something people for many, so many years have failed to have that attitude. I imagine if the police station is built where the fiasco of the bus station was, it will probably make the greatest difference to the center oh, I, of, of the I would course. think so, very definitely. Because for one thing, it will be visible. And uh, now, you'd have a rather difficult time directing a person to the police station. And you have a feeling that it's so crowded there that you might not even get to the desk. Very true. I had to go in there one night when my car stalled on a Christmas Eve, was it two or three years ago, and on Christmas Eve, try and get help. Well, it was on Dearborn Street, and I was able to leave you said, well, roll down the street at my start. They didn't, and I stopped Patty Corner at the corner of Dearborn and Tents. I went back to the house where I'd been visiting on Spring Street, telephone, I couldn't get him to rouse anyone. So the police station said, well, this not we'll get you help. And I waited to help him. Two young men came out of a bar across the street and came and said, what's your trouble? And I told them that apparently my parking lights had been left on carelessly. I didn't remember doing it, but they were on anyway. They got me. Oh, we'll get you started. I've got booster cables in my car. So we went into his car and turned it around facing the wrong way on the Started. I offered them a tip. Oh no, this is Christmas Eve. But I 
find out who they were and made the Newport game of who's your father, who's your mother. And I knew it was a family of one of them. Oh, they were only too glad to go. So I thought I'd better go and tell the police station that I had got going. I didn't dare shut my motor off. I was disgusted at that big station and I went to the door and went, oh, it was just grubby. Terrible. It's the only time I've been in. I didn't go to the open house before we voted on the loan. It was time. Yes, the bond issue is what I was Well, we, we know that redevelopment has not changed uh, your neighborhood uh, at all. Fortunately, we were afraid it was going to perhaps with the development of Eastbourne Roger State. But so far, things, things seem to be rather static there, I think. Um, I think that um, unless you have anything particular to reminisce about the America's Cup coming and going, from Newport, uh, I think that um, we've almost finished our reminiscences. Have you had any experience with the Australians or the British or the Italians or the French? No, I haven't. Because my association goes way back with the cup races. The first time I went out must have been, well, in the 30s. Thomas Lipton anyway, and we went out on Champion's garbage boat for the first races. We were fortunate enough to take a lunch. And I had a very different experience of going on a Coast Guard cutter, too. <laughs> but that day I thought, well, for uh, my host and me, I better take some lunch. I didn't know we were going to get fed, but we were. And and I went out on a small boat once since. But I don't know when you've seen one, you've seen all, I think. And uh, I followed them, of course, by radio and TV. I was just disgusted with everyone else on the tactics Americans in the last race. I still don't think we deserve to lose it. But I am not a proficient filmsman or anything of the sort, so perhaps I don't know what I'm talking about. Not in planning to go to Perth at the next one. Um, I don't know if I'd have to pitch a tent either if I did decide to go. Surprising how many Newporters are living in Australia now, though. I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Do you know uh, Georgia Carney, the casino? She has two daughters living there. Yeah. And then uh, relatives of the Farnhams are still over there. Jimmy Dunn, the optometrist, is over there. He used to have an office on the Alpha Broadway. So it's Did he go as an immigrant? I don't really know. I think he might just make his home there and establish the practice as far as I know. But then I heard someone else, and I thought that he was that that was relatives, I think, of Mrs. Carroll. Yeah, Mrs. Carroll, I think, is not a fan. Relatives who lives there still. Well, it's like the old uh, westward the course of empire, and they'll have to be coming back the other That's way right. sometime soon. Yeah. So it will probably all yeah. all come back. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you, Miss North, ever so much, and you've been very oh, it's kind. Been a pleasure. I just hope I have performed as the society had expected. I think the society will be very, very grateful mm -hmm. to you. Very rewarding experience for me. It's nice to reminisce. As you can see, I'm not at the loss for words. But you've been most generous of your long hours <laughs> with me.
I regret that we did not have a chance to discuss World War II. Miss North would have had tremendous numbers of recollections probably of her students, those who went to war and didn't come back. But we had gone on as long, I think, as it was fair to ask her to reminisce.